Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Noonday Bible Study here at Morning Star Missionary Baptist Church. My name is William Henderson. I am the senior pastor of the church. We're going to open up with a word of prayer, and we're going to pick up in our book where we left off at 2 Samuel chapter 16 and verse number 1. 2 Samuel chapter 16 and verse number 1. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for blessing us to come together today to consider the word of God. We pray you would speak to our hearts. Let the word of God penetrate our hearts. <clears throat> Let the word be planted in the good soil of the heart where it can take root in our lives, continue to make the changes necessary in us. We're not yet what we ought to be, but we thank you that we're not what we used to be. We ask Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts today. Give each of us a word. You know our situation. You know where we're at in our walk with Christ. Help us to better our walks. Help us, Lord God, to become more like your son. We pray that you'll be pleased with all that we say and with all that we do. In the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, I pray. Let everyone say amen. Switch over here so you can see me again. We're going to be picking up Second Samuel chapter 16 and verse number one. Amen. Now, last week we know David was on the run from his son Absalom, who has basically stolen away the kingdom from David himself. So we're going to pick up while David is on the run and the things that are happening to him while he is, in an essence, in exile, uh, fleeing for his life. And he's taking a contingent of soldiers with him and people that believe in him and will only accept him as their king. They follow along with him as well as he flees for his life. Beginning with verse number one, chapter 16. And when David was a little past the top of the hill, behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of asses saddled, and upon them two hundred loaves of bread, and a hundred bunches of raisins, and a hundred of summer fruits, and a bottle of wine. And the king said unto Ziba, Why, I'm sorry, what meanest thou by these? And Ziba said, The asses be for the king's household to ride on, and the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat and the wine that such as be faint in the wilderness may drink. So here we are. David is fleeing, and he's met by a servant of Mephibosheth. Now, we remember who Mephibosheth is. He's a descendant of Saul, who was dropped by the maid that was, that was to take care of him when he was a small child. And she dropped him and damaged both of his legs such that he could not walk. And David had pity on him, and because of Saul, his father, and David's love for Saul, he gave him a seat at his table to eat every day. Now, Mephibosheth doesn't know why in the world he deserves such a thing, but most certainly he's most grateful for it because with his legs damaged, him being unable to, to walk, he's not able to work. He can't have a field and grow things in a field, not enough to support himself uh, or anyone else that's a part of his family. But the king said, you will eat every day at my table. And so he did up until this point. David is fleeing now and Mephibosheth could not flee with him. So he had to remain in Jerusalem. But he sent out his servant, Zebub, all right? And he said to him, what do you mean by these things? Now, why would David question what he means by them? It would seem more appropriate to say, what are these things? What are they for? In essence, that's what he's asking him. But there's something else behind that. We'll cover that in just a second. And he says, I brought out these things that you might not have to walk. The beast of burden, they can carry you. Food so that anyone that is fled with you can eat if they be hungry, and wine, if there be any that are thirsty, can drink as you travel on your way. Verse 3 tells us, And the king said, and here it comes, 
And where is thy master's son? So we know his master, Mephibosheth, has a son. And David says, And where is thy master's son? And Zabah said unto the king, Behold, he abideth at Jerusalem, for he said, Today shall the house of Israel restore me the kingdom of my father. Let's put a pen right there, okay? David asked, where is thy master's son, Mephibosheth's son? Why didn't he bring it? Why did he have to sing a servant out? It was more honorable at that time to send a gift by way of a son, if you had a son, as opposed to a servant. It was viewed as more respectful. Now, David knows how good he's been to Mephibosheth. He's also been good to Zibal. But he's kind of looking at things as he sent his servant and not his son. That in that time in the king's eyes could be viewed as inappropriate, a disgrace or something like that. So Zabah has to explain more. Look at verse number four. Then said the king to Zabah, Behold, thine are all that pertained unto Mephibosheth. And Zabah said, I humbly beseech thee that I may find grace in thy sight, O Lord, O king. Zabah has talk, can tell, oh, this ain't going too well. So now he's pleading for grace. Smart move on his part to plead for grace in David's eyes because David knows about grace, God's grace, God's unmerited favor. Verse five says, and when King David came to Bahurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul. This is more of Saul's family, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gerar. He came forth and cursed still as he came. So he came out cursing and still cursing as he came forth to David. Now, Ziba is there. He hears everything that's going on. It's already a, beginning to develop to be a little bit of a tense situation. And out comes this man and look at what he is doing. He is cursing the king, the rightful king. Verse six says, and he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. The NIV says he pelted David and all the king's officials with stones, though all the troops and the special guard were on David's right and left. He has no fear of what David would do to him. He, would, he knows full well that David could order his one of his soldiers to kill him, to strike him dead. But he goes out there and does this because nothing's going to prevent him from doing what is in his heart to do, he is minded to do. And that is to say what he thinks is true. We're gonna find out what that truth is. All right, I wanna get ahead of myself. So it wasn't just David he threw rocks at. He threw rocks at those that came with David and he cursed at them as well, but he especially cursed at David. He said it out loud because he wanted everyone to hear. Hopes that they might agree with him and what he is saying. So the Bible says in verse seven, and thus said Shimei, when he cursed, come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. All right. He's calling David out, and he calls David a bloody man because, number one, he feels David is responsible for his father, Samuel, being killed which he was not. That was Samuel's undoing. He also feels that David has done him greater harm than just taking his father. 
So he called him a bloody man. Was David a bloody man? Yes, he was. David fought. Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands. He's a very good warrior, very good fighter, a good strategist at war. Is he a bloody man? Yes, he has taken life. Doesn't matter that they were the enemies of Israel. Doesn't matter that God told him to fight against the Philistines. Remember what he did to Goliath? Yes, he was a bloody man. He has taken life. But he also said, thou man of Belial. Now, who in the world is Belial and what could that mean? You know as well as I know that the names in the Hebrew and the Greek, even our names today, have meaning. Okay? Uh, the word I'm pronouncing, Belial, is actually pronounced Bel Ayaal. Okay? But it means one thing. Wickedness. So he is saying, come out, come out, thou bloody man and thou man of wickedness. Was David a wicked man? Yes, he was. And no, he wasn't. How can you both be wicked and not be wicked? That don't make no sense. He's done wicked things, but overall, he's not a wicked man. God called him a man after his own heart. And that says a tremendous amount about David's character, who he is, the things that he does, the way he thinks, the way he judges. So he's calling him out and trying to expose him as a murderer and as a wicked man. He says in verse eight, the Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of, thy, of the house of Saul. He's one of Saul's sons. In whose stead thou hast reigned. Ah, now it starts to come to light. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Yes, David has taken life. Yes, David has fought in wars. Yes, David has killed. Yes, it can be said that he's a bloody man. But for him to say, the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, he doesn't know that. He's not a prophet. He's heard that Absalom is king. That, that much has traveled as far as where he is. But when he sees King David, this is my time to go rub it in his face. Come on, you a bloody man. You are a wicked man. And he's rejoicing because he feels in his heart, God is finally returning all of this. He's glad to see David running. He's glad to see David in exile. But was that God's doing or was that Absalom's doing? Well, we say nothing happens without God. Nothing happens without God's permission, God's okay. This is not of God what Absalom has done. Absalom is continuing to act out of the wickedness that he harbored in his heart. When his brother slept with his sister and spoiled her, and he determined from that moment to take his brother's life, which he did. And now he wants the throne. And he's trying to take the throne away from King David. So Absalom wants this to be of the Lord as it pertains to David. And he's gloating in the midst of it at David, just happy that this is occurring and that things are working out the way they are right now for David. 
He says, this is the way the NIV translates, you have come to ruin because you are a man of blood. He has not come to ruin. God had promised him he would be king. God has not told him you will not be king any longer. Though he fled for his life, Absalom was coming to take the kingdom by force if necessary. He would have fought against his father and tried to kill his father. But his father didn't want to hurt his son, so he fled. Verse 9 says, and I want to get these names right. Then said Abishai, the son of Tseruyah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. What is he saying? He is saying, I will go kill this man, for he has insulted my king. And all he needs is the king's permission to let him go do it. And believe you me, he would go and lop off his head if the king gave him permission. It's already determined in his heart. All he needs is the king's okay. And what does David do? He's a man after God's own heart. He answers in verse 10, and the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Sir Yaya, uh, Sir Uya? So let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? What? Wait a minute. This is David talking? Yes, it's David talking. But you have to understand David's situation. David's not happy. He's, his heart is not filled with joy. He's grief stricken. He's fearful right now. He is this way because he's afraid of what his son might do. He has fled for his life because he fears his son might pursue and kill him, which he could do. But being in the state that he's in, he's down. He's willing to accept the chastisement of Shimei. And because he's down, he feels that who knows if the Lord has not told him to do this? Now, David makes an error there to me because where in the Bible does God tell us to go curse someone? I mean, literally curse, to hurl curse words at him as well as throw stones at him. Now, they stone sinners sometimes, but, but, but this isn't the same. David has remorse in his heart for his son Absalom and what he has done. He still loves his son, but his son is not in love with his father. So Absalom decided to take the kingdom by force if necessary, claim what was rightfully his. But Shimei is chastising David because he says, that David is the one that has stolen from him. In other words, let him curse. I feel bad already. Let him curse. I will hear the curse. Have you ever been upset because with yourself because of something you've done? And when somebody comes by, I can't believe what you did. Rather than tell them, look, stop, hush. I don't want to hear nothing else about it. You're like, just go ahead. Go ahead, I need to hear it. Go ahead. And you let them just go all in on you. David's in that kind of a state where let him speak. Let him speak. David's reflecting on past things he's done, all of which is not crystal clear and, and fantastic, but he is reflecting on that. So it is possible for us to be down and allow someone to 
chastise us while we're down and we receive it because in essence, it's what we want to hear at that moment in time. But what David has forgotten is that God said he would establish his kingdom and God did. And God has never said, today I'm taking the kingdom away from you. God has never said, you are no longer king of Jerusalem. David didn't want to fight with his son. That's a lose-lose situation. David knows he and his men would have prevailed, but what did the win mean for them if they won the battle? It meant he killed his son. And how would that look in the people of his kingdom's eyes that the king murdered his son. Wouldn't look good. David chose instead to flee so that he would not have to kill his son. Look at verse 11. And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone and let him curse. For the Lord has bidden him. The Lord had not bidden him. That was what he wanted to do. When he heard King David was near, he went out to do something he'd been longing to do. He's near, I will do this right now. He has harbored this anger, this hatred in his heart all this time. It has worn away on him until his reaction is like this to even his king. I don't accept your kingship. And I'm going to tell you why. David said, who knows? Maybe the Lord has been him. No, the Lord hadn't been him. The Lord doesn't bid us to go do such a thing to someone else. We do it when we're upset, we're angry with them, and we want others to know why. We want others to see them the way that we see them. So we speak bad about them, hoping that others will join our, in our cause, side with us, and say, you wrong for what you did. You are wrong. You were wrong. Won't make David feel any better. But right now, David is in a slump where he feels, I deserve this. Just let him go on cursing. The God might have told him to do this. Don't, don't, don't do anything to him. Don't hurt him in, in any way. He says in verse 12, it may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. God could yet turn this day around for me. And because he's done this to me, God can see it turn the day around. Verse 13, and as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. In other words, he didn't quit. He wanted to do, he's been longing to do this. And this is his opportunity to finally do it. Guess what? He's taking full advantage of that opportunity. Opportunity. Okay. Verse 14, and the king and all the people that were with him came weary. In other words, they arrived at their destination and refreshed themselves there. This was going to be their resting place from traveling all day. And so what happens when they stop to rest? Verse 15, and Absalom and all the people, the men, of, of Israel came to Jerusalem and Ahithophel with him. Now, who in the world is Ahithophel? He was one who would inform King David. He would stand before King David, tell him thus and thus. King David would follow his advice sometimes. But you know, I told you the names mean something. Let's see what his name, Ahithophel, means in the Hebrew, oh boy. And it means this, a brother of folly. That's not a good name because 
he's really not a good man. He is a man of folly. Oh boy. And he's been giving instructions even to King David. Yeah, he's been doing that. And now he's going to give instruction to Absalom. What is he going to say? Well, let's delve in and see. Verse 16, and it came to pass when, when Hushai, when Hushai, the Archae, uh, Archae, I think that's how that's pronounced. We say Archite because that's how it looks to us in the English. It's Archi, that's how it's pronounced. And the other, Hushai is how it is pronounced. The H sound has that hard K to it, Hushai. So, Kushai, the Archie, David's friend, was come unto Absalom, David's son, that Kushai said unto Absalom, God save the king, God save the king. Now, what in the world is he up to? There's a lot of deceit going on. Verse 17, and Absalom said to Kushai, is this thy kindness to thy friend? Why wentest thou not with? thy friend. Are you being kind to me, saying that I am your friend? Why didn't you go with your friend, King David? He's putting him on the spot, and how he answers this could be life or death for him. Okay? Verse 18, And Hushai said unto Absalom, Nay, but whom the Lord and this people and all the men of Israel choose, his will I be, and with him will I abide. Now, I don't know about you, but y'all, that's a weak excuse. That's a very weak answer. And here's why. He's not basing it on what he believes. He's following the crowd. Look again. Now he is smart enough to infer the Lord, but whom the Lord? You know, for as far as he's concerned, the Lord has put you here. God didn't do that. David is still the king. Absalom is just causing a, ruck, a ruckus. He said, and this people, the will of the people, what do y'all want? Whatever the majority wants, he's with it. And all the men of Israel, all those that have already shown their support of you, this is what he is saying. They've chosen, and the person they've chosen, his will I be. I will serve the strongest. I will serve whoever's in charge. That's all I'm saying. But what is your conviction? This has hurt the church, I believe. It used to be that whenever something needed to be voted on in the church, according to church constitutions, they used to require two thirds majority vote in order to do something. When they could not get two thirds majority, but the majority did want to do it, they would change the rules from two thirds majority to just majority rule. And then try to get what they want done done. We would not heed at two-thirds that maybe God is telling us this isn't what he wants. We're trying to force the issue by changing two-thirds to just a majority vote. 51-49, it passes. A vote of 51 to 49 is in danger of splitting a church. Folk, some folk don't care, just so long as they are on the winning side. It matters. It especially matters to me. I'd rather have an overwhelming majority. Now, there's something else I need to say about this because I'm talking about voting. You never vote on the word of God. If the Bible says thou shalt, we do. If the Bible says thou shalt not, we are not to. We do not vote. The Bible says thou shalt not steal. Uh, if I'm in order, I offer a motion that we don't steal. I can obtain a second. Nobody should second the motion. 
They should tell you crazy for even offering that ridiculous of a motion. The Bible already tells us not to steal. You know it's not right to steal. Why are we voting on whether or not we should steal? You don't vote on the word of God. But there are things the church needs to vote on, in my opinion. So we're, we're, uh, we are busy working at remodeling our church, having the pews reupholstered, the floor uh, redone so that we can beautify the interior of the church. What we have is very worn. Some of the pews need to be repaired, things like that. So working on doing that, how, how are we going? What color is it going to be? What kind of fabric? What kind of material is it going to be? The Bible does not say thou shalt have red carpet, blue carpet, white carpet, green carpet, gold carpet. It doesn't say none of that stuff. Thou shalt have wood floors. Thou shalt have tile floors. It doesn't say none of that stuff. So the church can make it whatever color the church feels is best. I'm not going to get in the way of that. I'll carry them through the voting process and, and do what I need to do as, as a moderator of meetings for them because I am the pastor of the church. But I will not get up and tell them, no, you can't have that color. And the body wants that color. We've already changed the color as it pertains to the church with the when we redid the pulpit and the choir law. And everybody loves that color. It could be that we find the same material we could have the pews upholstered in that. We find it in a high wear carpet. We could have it done, the floors done. And yes, there have been some, well, what about having wood floors? Well, we have to discuss that. Having wood floors, you're now prone to scratches, which have to be taken care of. Wood floors can still get scuffed up. What about tile? Well, when one breaks, it has to be replaced. When one cracks, it has to be replaced. It's a little expensive to replace a broken tile. You gotta dig grout out around it, redo the grout after you relay the tile. It's a lot of work. It's not just a simple, oh, dig it out, plop, drop this one in, all done. There's a lot more to it than just doing that. So we have to weigh benefits, cost, and what the church desires. And if the church says, pastor, you decide, I'll make a decision, but only at the request of the church. And even then, I would want the church to agree with the decision that I've made. Not say, oh, that was a terrible decision they made. We ain't gonna do, we don't wanna do that. And now you cause strife within the church. We have to be careful. If we follow God's word, we shouldn't have disagreements within the church. It's because we don't follow the whole will of God, that we do have disagreements within the church. So Hushai basically tells Absalom, I go with whichever way the crowd goes. That is not someone you can put trust in. Look at verse 19. And again, whom should I serve? This is still him talking. Should I not serve in the presence of his son as I have served in thy father's presence? So we see he was a servant to his father. He served in his father's presence. Now he wants to serve in his son's presence, Absalom. He says, so will I be in thy presence. As I've been before, that's just how I'm going to be. Okay. Your name does not carry good meaning. That doesn't bother him. He's going to be who he's going to be. And he's already told you. He follows the crowd. That's how he is. Bible, like the Bible says, be not blown to and fro by every wind of doctrine. He's blown to and fro by every wind of the crowd. That's not a good servant, by the way, just so people know. You don't do what the people want just so they will like you. You do what God says, whether they like you or not. What you want is God's approval. And sometimes that does mean well, everybody's going to hate me for this, but I've got to stand on the word of God. And you stand there. God will deal with everybody else. And when he does, they will be glad that you stood where you stood. And God can cause them to herald you a hero. But if you're wishy-washy, what, what, what does everybody say? 
Well, we wanted this. Okay, we'll do this. No, we wanted that away. Well, how many of them wanted that away? Well, it looks like they got majority. Well, we're we not going to do But you just said we're going to do this. You're going to get yourself into a lot of trouble doing stuff like that. Stand on God's word and on his word alone. Look at verse 19. He says it again, whom should I serve? I'm sorry, I did that one already. Look at verse 20. I'm sorry. I didn't move my marker. Then said Absalom to Ahithophel, give counsel among you what we shall do. The NIV says it this way. Absalom said to Ahithophel, give us your advice. What should we do? And believe you me, he's going to say something. Verse 21. And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, go in unto thy father's concubine, which he hath left to keep his house. And all Israel shall hear that thou art abhorred of thy father. Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. This is the NIV. Lie with your father's concubines, whom he left to take care of the palace. Then all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a stench in your father's nostrils, and the hands of everyone will be with you. I'm sorry, the hands of everyone with you will be strengthened. So what is he telling him to do? He's telling him, go commit sin. Go commit a sin, and by so doing, you'll sway the hearts of the people, and they will be with you. Because it was a sin for him to do what Ahithophel had told him to do. So what does Absalom do? Oh, he ain't gonna pass up an opportunity to stick it to his dad again. Verse 21, and Ahithophel said, I'm sorry, verse 22. So they spread Absalom a tent. Now watch this, this is very important. Upon the top of the house, and Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. On the roof of the household, all Israel could see what he was doing and noise it about. Does that sound familiar? We have to ask this question, is God visiting the sin of the father on his son? What are you talking about, Pastor? Remember Bathsheba was taking a bath on the roof of her house. And it was a time when the men went to war, only David did not go, and he was walking on the roof of his house. And he saw from his roof Bathsheba taking a bath, and he desired her. So much so till he sent his servants to get her and bring her to him, which they did. And he lay with her. Where were they? On the roof of his palace where people could see. And she went back home and then she sent word back later that she was with child. And remember what David did? I've got to cover this thing up. So he summoned her husband, Uriah, come back. Tell me how the war is doing. Tell me how everything's going. Uriah gave him a point. He said, okay, man, great. Tell you what, go home, enjoy your wife. What he's saying is go home, make love to your wife, cover up the sin that I have done. You do that, you will believe it's your child and everything will be fine. What did he do? He slept at the king's door. He said, I will not go home and enjoy my wife while all my brothers are out here fighting for my king and for my kingdom. He didn't go. So David had to come up with another plan. He came up with another plan. He sent him back with a letter. It was a death letter, a letter for his own death instructing the captain to put him where the fiercest fighting was and to withdraw so that the enemy could overcome him and kill him, which the captain did. And then we sent word back, Uriah is dead. And then David goes, all right, now this is what I'm going to do. He takes Bathsheba to be his wife, brings her in. Now, the people will think what I've done is a good thing. Her husband died. Ain't it great that the king took his wife in and now he's going to take care of her too? Oh, and look, he even blessed her with a child. You can't cover sin. And remember the prophet came, told him the story about the old man, poor man that had just one ewe lamb and the rich man who had all this other. And when the guest came to the rich man's house, he took the poor man's little ewe lamb and killed it and served it to his guests. 
David was angry and said, who has done this? That man shall die. And that's when Nathan struck him and said, thou art the man. In other words, David knew, oh God, my sin has been exposed. What David did was not confess his sin. What David did was cover up his sin. What God did was send his prophet to uncover the sin so that it could be dealt with. David's feeling real bad, but remember what the prophet said? God has put this away from you. God has already forgiven you of this sin. But because you have done this, brought, put the sword to Uriah, the sword will never depart from you. could have had a kingdom of peace, but now he's going to have to continue to fight. But he never once imagined the man he would be fighting would be his son. His son walked in his father's footsteps. God visited the sin of the father on the father's son. David now feels even more of what he has done. It's a terrible thing. Verse 23, in the council of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. In other words, his counsel was like one who went and inquired of God and came back and thus saith the Lord. That's how people felt about his counsel, but he did not do that, which tells us what? His counsel was not entirely right. He didn't go inquire of God. He just stated what he thought. He pretended to be something he was not. Because a real prophet would have went and inquired of God. He didn't leave and go inquire of anyone. When they asked what should he do, he just gave them what he thought good. We're going to see next week what he gets him. We're going to stop here. We'll pick up at chapter 17 and verse 1 on next week. Please keep um, Deacon Deaconess Hill, Deacon Baker, Deacon Chavis, Deacon and Deaconess Williams in your prayers. Please pray for all our congregation, every household of morning sorrow. Please pray for your pastor and his family. Everybody can use prayer. Join us, if you will, Sunday mornings from 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. for our hour of power where we kneel in prayer. We just pray. You don't have to kneel. You can come and sit in the pew, but we bow our heads and we pray. I can't even kneel right now until this kneel is this knee of mine is healed up. Then I can go back to kneel. But guess what? Once it's healed, I'll be back kneeling with my stand and with the pads and stuff like that, like I should have been, not on that hard floor. That's what hurt my knee and damaged it. So I'm getting it fixed up now. But we want to see you there. Amen. Don't forget, come back, join us for our evening Bible study in the book of Ecclesiastes. We'll see you later on this evening. Let us close our eyes for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you now for blessing us today in our Bible study. Help us to learn from David, from Absalom, from all these characters, Lord, because we make mistakes too. We don't always follow the wisest of counsel. We don't always inquire of God, what shall I do? We just decide for ourselves what we're going to do, and then we go do it. Shame on those who do not care how it makes their brother or their sister feel. Yes, the truth hurts, but the truth also heals. Lord, keep watch over everyone under the sound of my voice. Bless every household of Morningstar, every member. And I pray you would bless our leadership and bless me, especially as their pastor. We ask these blessings in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let everyone say amen. God bless your hearts. See you later on today. Bye-bye.